Mm. Abdullah? Yes? Uh, is Shiresh talking already or? No, no, no. We, we just like really, we decide to wait for five minutes to allow other people to join. So for people who just join us, please, we will just start after two minutes exactly, just to allow more people to join. Cool. So good evening and hello everyone. Thank you to join us in the second day of the first African Biogenome Project of an Institute for Genomics and Bioinformatics Workshop on Endemic uh, African Species. So as I informed you yesterday, today it will be more about the bioinformatics things. We have two sessions, the first session about the statistical and bioinformatics data analysis platforms. And in this session, we have two speakers, First speaker, Suresh Masalumini uh, from H3 Bionet, uh, University of Cape Town, South Africa. Please, Suresh, if you are ready, go ahead. Thanks, Abdullah. <clears throat> and good afternoon, everyone. As Abdullah mentioned, my name is Suresh Masalumini. I'm a systems administrator by trade. And currently, I'm the chair of the Africa BP IT subcommittee. This committee, just at a very high level, is tasked with researching and introducing IT based uh, solutions to the research challenges faced by the African Biogenome Project. But for this talk, I just want to introduce you to a survey system that we use called REDCAP. <clears throat> so, uh, the presentation itself is just a short 15 minutes, so I'm just going to cover a very high overview of the system itself. So I'll briefly go over what REDCap is, uh, why you should consider using REDCap. I'll look at a few of the Red, uh, REDCap re resources on uh, that you have available to you. Then we'll just look at some of the local infrastructure for installing REDCap. And I'll briefly talk about uh, some of the use cases where we are adopting REDCap in Africa BP and I'll round off with a red cap demo and then leave a few minutes for questions at the end. So let's jump right in. Um, what is red cap? So red cap stands for research electronic data capture software. Uh, it was developed in 2004 at Vanderbilt University in Texas. It was developed by a group of clinical researchers that required access to a secure data capturing system. And that's how REDCap uh, came about. The REDCap itself uh, describes itself as a secure web application for building online servers and databases. I think the word databases here is a slightly um, uh, misunderstood. It's, uh, it, it's not a 
document management or a genomic database uh, management tool of sorts. It's really just the collection of text and survey data uh, type of database. So really text-based. The system is online and offline as well. <clears throat> offline components of or the offline interface is managed through a mobile client that's then uploaded once it connects to the, the, the online website. RedCap itself is free for nonprofit organizations, but it's not open source. So to get a license, you need to enter into an agreement with uh, RedCap at Funderbelt itself. So why would you want to use RedCap when there are already free survey tools out there like SurveyMonkey, Google Forms, etc.? So largely, RedCap is, was designed and used in the clinical setting, but effectively it can be used to collect a wide range of data across various environments. Um, and as mentioned, you can also install it locally. When you have a local installation of your, your survey system, you have full control of your data and access over your data. With the system being installed locally, you also have more control and compliance to regulatory compliance, such as GDPR, Copia in South Africa, and HIPAA, et cetera. The system also has multi-language support. So what that really means is that um, you, uh, survey participants or data capturers via a drop-down list can choose a language uh, that's closer to their home language so that the forms are easier to read, uh, which would speed up overall uh, completion of these uh, items. At the moment, the red cap is installed in English by default, but it does have support for Chinese, Portuguese, <coughs> sorry, Chinese, Portuguese, and uh, German and French. Uh, RedCap also has some design logic uh, built into it, which I haven't seen in some of the free tools. So what this basically is that, so when you're creating a form and you're trying to um, cater for wide audiences and across different environments, you often have a very long form and often people don't like uh, completing long surveys. So with branching, branching logic, you are able to uh, use conditional statements where you can uh, uh, expand or, or hide uh, questions based on the, the choices made in the question before. So that overall reduces the length of the, the survey itself and it allows you to customize it a lot better. It also has auto uh, email notification reminders. So for example, if you start a survey where you're collecting some form of data, you can set an auto yeah, reminder right. so that, hello? So you could set an auto reminder uh, so that let's say in two, three months. Suresh. Ah, sorry, I thought I did unmute myself. My apologies, guys. I'll, I'll start all over again. No, no, you, you did unmute yourself. Um, it's just that we muted everyone. So just continue from where you are. Yeah. Okay. All right, so where was that? So auto email notification reminders. Uh, so the system also has the ability to, so when you create a survey link, you usually have a long string of characters that is not uh, human readable. And it's, it's an, I know tools out there like tinyurl uh, and a couple other tools allows you to make shorter, more human readable um, URLs. The nice thing is that RedCap has that uh, built in, so it's just nice to have. It also exports to Excel and PDF format, as well as some statistical packages like SATA, R, et cetera, which is also useful to put it into your uh, analysis uh, applications. Uh, RedCap comes in two flavors, standard and long-term release. The standard is more for the guys that are, are cutting edge. So on a monthly or, or Every two months you get uh, feature releases and updates, whereas long-term release is more for production where it really gets updated over a six month period. <clears throat> RedCap also has single sign-on authentication built into it so that you can integrate into organizational um, authentication systems to minimize account management. Okay, so RedCap's resources, how do you get access to Red, RedCap? So Africa BP has a instance of RedCap running at the moment. It's available to researchers affiliated with uh, Africa VP. And in the demo that I'll do, if we have some time available, I will 
I'll show you quickly uh, around the interface for the African BP instance. There is a red cap cloud. So let me just enable the pointer so it's easier to show what I'm talking about. Red cap cloud is a commercial offering that's fee based. Um, <clears throat> you can, for a fee, get access to this interface and get support through that um, organization. Vanderbilt itself has a red cap system that it makes available. This too is a fee based uh, access. And you need to, as I mentioned, uh, the organization needs to enter into an agreement with Thunderbolt itself. They also have a demo system that you can use. The demo system is available for one week. <coughs> and all data or survey information will be deleted after that week. And as I mentioned, you've got a local installation. So the local installations, you need to sign up as a partner. And if you're a nonprofit organization, you do get the software for free, but like I mentioned, it's not open source. So there are some rules and regulations you've got to adhere to. From a support uh, perspective, the Thunderbolt has a red cap community uh, and you get access to that once you sign up and get a license from red cap itself. And that's generally managed by red cap users and administrators. So people go there to get their questions answered. And then we have something uh, locally, red cap Africa is the branding that's managed uh, in Southern Africa at the University called WITS. And they've got a regional support group similar to the, the, the community where it's based on users and systems administrators that support guys uh, within Africa. So if anybody would like to join that uh, group mailing list, etc., there's the link you would go to. And I'm sure I'll ask Abdullah to share these links after the meeting for those that are interested in the various options. So, Let's quickly have a look at infrastructure. So RedCap is very simple to install. Uh, it can be installed on a single machine, uh, but the, requirement, the recommendation is to split the uh, web server front end um, content with the database to secure your information. Uh, it's preferable that you have that behind a reverse proxy and behind organizational firewall um, just to protect your data. AWS also has a a, a uh, deployment module that they have for RedCap. Uh, their website states that you can have a RedCap instance deployed within 20 minutes, which is very impressive. Uh, RedCap goes one step further where they separate the database, the file uh, upload uh, services from the web front end uh, for the system. Uh, this is a fee based um, for the resources itself, but you can put the nonprofit license of RedCap in there. So. Just be reminded that this is a charge for, for the resources. <clears throat> I see that I've got about five minutes left, so I'll speed up a bit. In terms of um, the use cases for Africa BP, at the moment we're using RedCap to conduct surveys uh, amongst uh, the group itself, the project. We're also using it for count requests. Um, and as a proof of concept, we're looking at using RedCap to collect the metadata for samples that are collected by my colleague Verena. Okay, so I want to do a demo now. I had a pre-recorded uh, video for you guys, but when I uploaded things to Google Drive, I see that it didn't um, pull the audio through. So what I'll do is I'll do a live demo. Can you guys still see my screen now with the RedCap interface? Yes. Okay, perfect. So as I mentioned, you can access the uh, Africa BP RedCap instance from RedCap African Biogenome. Uh, if you don't, if you are affiliate of Africa BP and you don't already have an account, you can click on this link. So this is what one of the forms will look like typically. This is just a very basic form where you're collecting some information for the account creation. Uh, it gives you a submit button, so it's very plain and simple, <clears throat> and it allows you to customize it with logos, colors, etc. So let's just log in here quickly. Give me a second. One moment, guys. Okay, here we go. So once you have your account and you're logged in, this is what users will see. So every time you create a project, uh, it lists up over here. Uh, to create a new project, you click on this link. And for systems administrators, you have a control panel. So the control panel is quite useful. 
you have control over the system. You can have a look at what users you have, where they're logging in from, login activity. So what are users currently doing? You're able to browse projects based on uh, a user or project's name. You can manage users and then overall system management tools. Let's just go back to my projects quickly. So if you click on in my project, it's all you got to do is do a title. You select the purpose of it. We'll do it just for fun now and put something there and create it. And that's it. You've now created your survey. Once you're in this, this interface, this is a wizard that you need to go through. And once all of this is, you click done on all of these, the survey becomes live. But to design the survey, you click on the online designer. There's the survey we just created now. And you've got a blank slate. So you just add a form. Uh, for example, we'll choose text box. We call it first name. You need to put in a variable. And choose whether or not it needs to be required or not. Click on save, and it's there. Uh, let's just do a second one quickly. This time, let's choose a yes or no box. Let's go, do you want to have a mailing list? The mailing list there. Oops. And that pop, pops up over there. If you need to, to edit any of these, you just click on the pencil icon and you can edit it and change the types of um, systems that you have. And you see it now drops to a drop down box. If you want to add in the branching logic I mentioned earlier on, you click on that little arrow and here's where you type in all your branching logic. So basically if you have a radio question over here and you can say, um, do you require something? If you click no, it will hide all the other boxes below that. If you click yes, it will then expand and show you all the other boxes. So, so that's what I mean, it's quite useful where you don't get this long list of uh, questions on a survey. <clears throat> um, what else can I show you here? I see I've got one minute left. Um, actually, let, let me close off here because we are running quite low on the time. If anybody else wants a more in-depth demo, I can uh, take them through the system and talk them through any questions they might have. And I think I'll stop here and open the floor to questions for everyone. Thanks, Suresh. So any questions, Suresh? So maybe a quick question from my side. Uh, so, but if I understand well also RedCab, it is possible to use to apply some R package uh, uh, analysis. So it, it's not, you don't do that within RedCap itself. You would export uh -huh. the data and it will be packaged in the uh, R uh, format, file format, so that you can do uh -huh. import. So it's more like you can prepare form, uh, like create form or even like some kind of R code creator, let's say, isn't it? Correct. So it depends on what, you, what you're gathering. So for example, if you're just doing a survey, for example, uh, on how many people are having a particular problem, that data, you, you got some built-in graphing that you can do uh, to do basic graphs. But if you're doing a more in-depth uh, survey or data capture, that data you can then export into um, our package or Stata or SPC, uh, SPC, SPSS. Uh, program so they can just import it uh, straight away. Sure. Uh, we have a question to from Bobby. Bobby, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Abdullah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Suesh, for the nice and interesting presentations. So I have two straightforward questions. Um, the first one is we can use um, um, uh, this software uh, for uh, other projects than those fixed by Africa BP? I mean, if we are partner of Africa BP, could we have access to this software to use it in other projects? Um, so that, that would be that's, a that's the, first, that's, that's the first one. To be made by, by thank God. Sorry, uh, carry on. What's the second question? Okay. Uh, yeah, the second, it is the same. I mean, in the same sense. I mean, uh, could each one have one... Um, I mean, one code access, or one user access, or we can have two, for example, if we have 
because we are conducting clinical trials so in two cities so uh, that's sure. the problem thank you so so okay thanks so when you have an account and you create a and they call it an instrument, uh, the, the tool. So when you create an instrument in um, RedCap, it's only visible to you itself. But from the back end, I can grant other users access to that instrument. So if you have various members of your team that's working on it, I can grant them access so they will see it and they can edit it uh, as well. So uh, you don't have a, a team sort of uh, environment but you can collaborate with other members that have access to RedCap, yes. And okay. for your first question, I was just saying that um, access to the system would be a policy a decision based on uh, the Africa BP Steering Committee. So once you follow the, the form that I showed you early on to create an account, one of the questions there is what is the, your, your capacity within Africa BP? And that will be submitted to us, which uh, would be then reviewed. And if it's uh, approved, we will create the account for you. OK, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you for the question. So I have, another, yeah, I have a new qu other question from from Marie in the chat box. Is the RedCare platform to be used for data capture when collecting species and tissue samples in field. So you say that again, Abdullah? Yeah, so is the RedCap platform to be used for data capture when collecting species and tissue samples in field? Uh, so, so that is the hope for now, we're not using it. So I need to first liaise with my colleague, Perina, who's managing the sample uh, subcommittee. But the intention is that we would use REDCap to, um, to record the metadata for the, the samples that they collect. And as I mentioned, there is a mobile application. So one could capture that information in the field. And once they get to a place that has internet activity, uh, connectivity, sorry, they can then merge that data into the online system. Yeah. So it's yeah, I would, yeah, I would say really yes. And because of this, really, we, we Suresh Rak really did like this in essence for Africa BB because we think really it will be very useful for the data collection, especially subcommittee. So another question, could you please cite an example of using RedCab in bioinformatics project? Um, well, I'll leave that uh, question expanded a bit. I yeah. think you're asking, can you do statistical um, I think it's more system. statistical than, than really by like really sequencing data-based analysis, isn't it? Correct. And, and like I mentioned in the beginning, that the wording of RedCap is a bit misleading. Uh, the system is really just a survey and data capturing platform, uh, but it is adaptable that you can use it across environments um, for other purposes as well. But yeah, you, you can't do any computational um, workload on the system. Yeah. Uh, so we have another couple of questions, but uh, if you don't mind, I will keep it at the end. We will, I will promise you will have also this open discussion uh, time. But now to move to the next speaker, uh, Nidal Gamni from Western Institute of Tunisia. Uh, please, Nidal. Maybe we have to. Hello, everyone. Nidal? Yes. Can you share your screen, please? Sure. Yes, perfect. Go oh, ahead. That, can you see the screen right now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, my name is Nizal Ghani. I am system administrator at the, at the Pasteur Institute of Tunis, and I am co chair of the IT and informatics subcommittee with the African Biogenome Project. Today, I am going to introduce the Galaxy Project and its usage with the bioinformatics. Okay. Nidal, could you please put the, your presentation in full screen mode? Oh, okay. Sorry. 
Is it fine now? Uh, is it full screen now? Uh, I think you have I, two screens, two, two yeah, monitors. Two. Oh, you have sorry, two monitors. Have... Okay. Just. What is it? Anyway, go go ahead. Don't worry. This is still is really clear. Just a moment, please. Uh, it's still two screens. Because it is in the presenter view, actually. Uh, uh, you can you still uh, you need just you need just to switch between the viewer. So you are in the presenter viewer. Okay. Okay, so uh, still the same issue. Exactly. So much. <laughs> anyway, I think you can you can do it in both. It will be fine. Even like this, I think it's okay. Okay. So we are going to talk about the Galaxy itself and what is Galaxy, uh, the public service, uh, public service of use Galaxy, and. Is there any possibility of use Galaxy for Africa? And finally, we are going to see how to use Galaxy. So let's start with uh, presenting the Galaxy project uh, with increasing importance of all large data sets uh, had led to the development of new tools and workflows that can help scientists improve the quality of their studies. The Galaxy project was established in 2005 by Penn State, Johns Hopkins, uh, OHSU, and Cleveland Clinic, with other contributions that had also made big efforts to develop and make training materials publicly available. We can see the names of uh, contributors on the next link that we already have one of them. Uh, he's our colleague, Gilo. Uh, so the main goal of this alliance was to enable biomedical scientists to access and use data analysis tools. It aims to provide an, an accessible and versatile platform for performing data analysis, regardless of their expertise, and it aims to continuously improve the quality of their analysis through its transparent communication. And let's start. This, that was a little introduction about the Galaxy project and how it begins. And uh, what's the use of Galaxy itself? Uh, it's uh, an open, open source platform that enables users to perform data analysis and work through, uh, workflows through its graphical web interface. It can be used also interactively uh, to plug in various tools and workflows such as Jupyter and RStudio. Simply, uh, it's a web app running into a physical infrastructure that allows users to process large data sets without having to interact with it directly. I mean, uh, the physical infrastructure. It can also be run on a cluster or on a cloud platform. So for the Galaxy servers, uh, we have three main public servers. Uh, all of them, uh, the first one was established in 2005 uh, in the United States of America. Uh, it's running in Texas. And we can see the link that use Galaxy, the main, the main link, usegalaxy.org. Uh, and later in 2008, uh, 2018, sorry, uh, we got two new servers running publicly. Uh, they are the European server and the Australian server. So, and during the last two years, the Galaxy team and the open source community around Galaxy have made 
substantial improvements to Galaxy's core framework, user interface tools, and training materials. Uh, framework and user interface improvements now enable Galaxy to be used for analyzing tens of thousands of datasets. And more than 5,500 tools are available from the Galaxy Tool Shed. The Galaxy Tool Shed is like the uh, repository of the uh, of the tools that can be you install it or use it uh, by users. Uh, the Galaxy community has led an effort to create numerous high quality tutorials focused on common types of genomic analysis. The Galaxy developer and user communities continue to grow and be integral to Galaxy's development. The number of Galaxy public service developers contributing to the Galaxy framework and its tools and users of the main Galaxy server have all increased substantially. So, a Galaxy for Africa. We, uh, like the subcommittee chairs uh, of ADIP, African Biogenome projects move it into action and working to have our African Galaxy instance in order to support African researchers and scientists to engage directly into bioinformatics. This can assist everyone and especially research with limited resources as they will need only a laptop and internet access to start analyzing their data and workflows. As Galaxy is a scientific workflow data integration and data analysis persistence uh, and publishing platform that aims to make computational biology accessible to research scientists that do not have computer programming or system administration experience. We made as a beta, uh, a publicly available instance of Galaxy running in Tunisia. Uh, it's still under development also, we still need some more work to upgrade uh, the physical resources, uh, especially the storage that will enable everyone to store, uh, upload and uh, store his data, download his data into uh, the server uh, in order to make it accessible and used by everyone. Uh, we can check the instance from that link it's now live and running and to tesla.pasture.tm uh like as as the as the server is busy uh so we've created we've created a specific port for this up for this instance could you is it possible to share uh, the link in the chat box in the uh, yes sure I will share it. Let's move now to how to use Galaxy. For the Galaxy interface, we have three main panels. On the left, we have uh, available tools. On the middle, we can view the data and, run, and, run, and to run the tools. On the right, we can see the history uh, of our analysis. Let's have a... Let me share quickly the uh, web interface. Maybe I can... Uh, So you still see my screen, right? Yes. Okay then. So uh, as we said, the, those are the three main uh, interface. Uh, we have we have on this uh, right corner we have the tools. 
but we can browse and select any tool that we are willing to use uh, from here. Uh, on the middle, we can we can see the tools. We can set the tools parameters, uh, everything for that, and to execute. And on the left side, we have the history. Uh, so if we are going to, uh, for example, to upload any data or to run any tool, we can check the history here, just right here. Uh, about uploading data. Uh, we can upload uh, using three methods uh, through from uh, directly from computer or to import files from a URL or to import it from a public data stores like UCSB, US, UCSC, NCBI, ENA, and many more. The, uh, the upload button is just here. So we can click on it uh, and we can here drop, uh, we can click uh, choose local files, for example, like this one, or to pass uh, some, some links uh, from uh, external servers to upload our files. On the history panel, we can, we can check the history collects uh, for the analysis. Uh, we, we will be have we will be having uh, some buttons uh, like uh, Galaxy Eye or the Galaxy Pencil, Galaxy Cross. All those uh, can give us some uh, some modes to to can give us some uh, edits to our history, like to view, to edit attributes, or we can delete uh, delete a file or a record. There is also, uh, if we click on the, uh, on the name of the history, also we can, uh, it, it will be expanded and we'll be having the file informations like size, format, uh, or a, a preview. Uh, so, finding a tool. This is uh, how we are going to choose a tool uh, from that panel and to uh, execute it. Uh, it's simply by exploring the tool panel, uh, have finding the tool name and uh, clicking on it. We can also make a search here, for example, I don't know if we have something like, uh, want to use fast uh, to convert some file uh, from FastQ to Faster, uh, we just uh, search the tool name, uh, click on it, and then we'll be having uh, putting parameters here and our inputs first. Uh, so after uh, choosing our file, setting the parameters, we can execute uh, the tool and we'll be having uh, uh, the execution in the history record on the uh, history panel. The analysis results. Uh, tool outputs are added to the history. So uh, different data sets states, uh, we can check uh, after running uh, a job, we will be uh, seeing like uh, different states like waiting, running, uh, or success or failing. Uh, sometimes some jobs might may be failing uh, due to some uh, uh, internal server issue or something. We can uh, expand the results for more options. Uh, if it is uh, a success, of course, we can download the data set. We can check the information or we can reload or visualize. Galaxy also have uh, its uh, visualize uh, a, a good uh, framework for visualization. Uh, it's called like Galaxy Charts. It's visualization framework for JavaScript basic third party visualization plugins, uh, which sits on the top of Galaxy's visualization framework. Currently, about 13 visualizations ra ranging from bar diagrams, uh, like uh, 
different names like bar diagrams, pie charts, uh, scatter plots to molecule and protein viewers. And uh, cytoscape and phylogenetic visualizations are available. And there is, of course, there is more. Uh, Shards allows uh, these plugins to benefit from galaxies uh, for building capabilities to easily define input parameters and data options uh, for the configuration of third party visualization plugins. Uh, it's similar to how tools are added to the Galaxy platform. Uh, um, I, I cannot show you here, here because I don't have uh, a history, but after having a history record here, we can, uh, as we said, we can click to expand on it and we will be having a visualization view icon. We can click on it and we'll be having a visual into uh, the middle of the screen. So as we see this example, we'll be having different uh, outputs like uh, pie charts or diagrams or uh, as we wish. Uh, also, using Galaxy, you can start running uh, multiple analysis. Uh, to start a new analysis, we have to create uh, a new history. Uh, can have many histories uh, as we wish also, uh, and overview all, all of our history. Uh, we can uh, set names for the histories, so we keep track of our analysis. Uh, adding a history like you can click on this uh, plus button, it will create uh, a new history uh, because I, we don't have any history here, so it will not be expanded. But uh, if, you, if you are already, uh, if someone is already running some uh, jobs and want to have a new uh, history, he can click on this plus button and it will be expanded into uh, multiple histories from here. So, so that was for the Galaxy. Uh, thank you for your attention. And it's time for your questions. Thank you, Nidal. So, any question for Nidal? So I'm wondering if you have already some like really a small subset of data to upload it maybe or transform it. Nidal, please mute, unmute yourself. Nidal. Yes, so could you unmute yourself, Nidal? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I yeah. was having the right to unmute myself. Yeah, so do you have any a small file or so to try to upload it and convert it or so to, to the attendees. Okay, uh, let's try a quick upload from the, uh, from the VGP apply, uh, pipeline training. Just, we can, uh, this is, uh, an upload from from external repositories. It's not from a local my local computer. So uh, for this thing, uh, we are have col columns names like A B C D. Uh, we can have some. We can add some definitions for that. So let's set the, uh, column A as name. Uh, the second is the URL, the other one uh, as type, 
as we see this. And a name tag, and lastly. So as we see, we got this message, uh, the building uh, of those last rules that we uh, up, we are trying to upload uh, are, are submitted to our instance and it's it's live. We can just uh, check from the history here and wait for it uh, until we got it like green. Green uh, color means uh, success. Yeah, so may, maybe it will take a while. So I will use a chance to ask the question you receive until it get uploaded. So first question is Galaxy able to face analysis that ask a lot of memory, like maximum likelihood for phylogenetic tree analysis? Yeah, it will be. It, it's, it only depends on the uh, instance, uh, on how much resources we will, we will need. Uh, for example, I think on this, uh, on our instance, uh, we can, uh, we can do this. Uh, we don't have problem with memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 what I'm not really sure about it, even in the original Galaxy, what is uh, what is uh, resources quota? I know about that they have some like really limitation for the memory and CPUs because I'm not sure about this. I know they give you some quota for the storage. Uh, but I'm not sure about the resources. Do you have an idea about this? Uh, yes, I think uh, as per user, uh, if you, for example, uh, create an account into the European, European uh, Galaxy server, uh, you will be having like uh, 215 gigabytes of memory and uh, like uh, 96 cores. Uh, second question, what is the space assigned for new users? Uh, sorry, what means uh, the space? Uh, I mean the storage, uh, the storage uh, quota. I don't know if it's really this for our galaxy or for, for the instant. So uh, they already... For okay, I will reply for both. Uh, yeah, for the uh, public servers, uh, you can, every user can have 200 gigabytes. Uh, if mm -hmm. I'm not wrong, I think it's like 200. Yeah. Uh, for our instance, uh, I think we can go for more right now and yeah. we can expand uh, expand uh, also the storage, the local yeah. storage. Uh, I'm talking about like physical resources. Yes, yes. So we have a couple of questions from oral questions. So please, Shukwokra, please unmute yourself. And Hello. 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 All Go right. Ahead. Thank you. My name is Chukuka Obonna from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, please go for your question. Shukuoka. Okay. Shukuoka, can you go ahead, please? We, we have another question from Tao. Please, Tao. Hello, Tao. Hello. Hello. Yes, can please go me? ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Can yes, hear yes, me? clear. Yes, clear. Please go ahead. Um, I have a. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Please go ahead for the question. So my. Uh, Tao, are you still talking? Yeah. No, I think he's really good. Yeah. Tao, you, now you are on mute, so please reply, re repeat your question, please. I don't know if I should continue to ask. Obona is, oh, no, Obona, 
Obona is about to pass, so we are both talking simultaneously. So, are, no, but uh, I think it's only okay. you. I it's just really want to pass. Um, yes. The format. Tao. Okay, please, if you can write your question in the, in the chat box. So we have another question from the chat box about, okay, Sentinel, please can one run as she was study using both phenotypic and genetic marker data in Galaxy? Another question, are they demos on data analysis? I'm not sure about the second one. So Nidal, do you get it? Uh, which question exactly? I mean, like, I'm not sure, you know, like Galaxy generally, it is really like, you know, simply you can run your tool, which is usually the command line based and it needs some resources. So generally you can do this in Galaxy with the resources of Galaxy itself and like for sure with the tool, but I, I'm not sure if really there is some uh, GeoWars analysis related tools in the Galaxy. In our Galaxy for sure not. Uh, I'm not sure about the original uh, Galaxy. Are you familiar that they have some GWAS uh, data analysis within the galaxy? Uh, the thing is only uh, I never tried GWAS uh, tools, but uh, we we can we can go to. Yeah, yeah I think you always you you, always, you you can always search it. You know, it's the same. And I didn't do it also myself. I never do GWAS and. Uh, using uh, Galaxy. There is, there is yeah. uh, some GWAS tools uh, yeah. that we can install, yes. Yes. Okay, I hope these really answer the question. So, okay, another question. Thank you, Nidal, for the presentation. I would like to ask about the type of statistics uh, offered by this workflow system. Uh, I think it's like really for the statistical analysis, I think it's uh, Galaxy do more bioinformatics, but also I'm not sure what kind of statistical data analysis it can perform. But again, it depend depend what you want to do and the availability in the tool, isn't it? Nadal, do you have mm -hmm. any comment about this? Like uh, about type of statistics offered by this one. Yeah. Okay, so another question, if I'm not too familiar with computer programming, how I can, how can this open platform help me? So if, if, if she's not really bioinformatician, how Galaxy can help? So uh, that's that's like uh, why Galaxy was made uh, because it will not require uh, programming experience or any physical resources uh, or any uh, system administration experience. Uh, everyone can uh, simply have access to uh, an instance like this one and can search, search the tool that he needs uh, to use. He, he will uh, set the inputs here. He will set the parameters and he can execute that yeah. like this. So no, nothing uh, special is needed. No programming skills are needed. Yeah, as you said, this is really in the first place why, why Galaxy, uh, why, why we need Galaxy. So another question before the break. So please clarify the data format to be imported to Galaxy. Will an incorrect format be a problem to run analysis in Galaxy? 
It just depends on the on the right tool that can uh, uh, that have to read your your data uh, type. So, uh, but most of uh, bio, uh, biological data can 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 be uh, uploaded to Galaxy, like the okay. fast files, FASTA files, or any type of files. Uh, most of them can be uh, uploaded and read. Yeah. So thank you so much, Nidal. So before to move to the main event for today uh, and for the whole workshop, uh, I want really to ask you to go for break for let's return like five minutes past four. So which mean like after seven seven minutes exactly. And please for for remaining question for sure we will have this open discussion slots and we can really. Uh, discuss and ask all the questions with uh, all the speakers. Before to leave to the break, please, I would ask you if it's possible. Uh, I, I'm really, uh, we need to take some picture, some screenshot for the for the participants. So if you don't mind, if you want to appear in those ones, please open your camera. And also please remember that before the end of the next session, we will share some evaluation for please. It will be very helpful for, for us if you if you already feel it. Uh, Suresh, please, could you please stop sharing your screen? Okay. This one. Another one. Last one. Okay, thanks so much. Now we will have break and we will return after exactly five minutes. Uh, Jolie, sorry, we will have, I know we have to, we plan to start at four o'clock, but we will have like five minutes break.
So hello everyone, good evening again. So now the next session about the sequencing quality control and assembly pipeline. Uh, for, for we have Jolio Formenti from Vertebrate Genome Project, Rockefeller University USA. So please Jolio, if you are ready, you can share your screen. Julio. Okay. Hi. Yes. yes. Yeah. I was, uh, you did. All right. One second. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Um, the show. We are really happy uh, to be here today. Uh, my name is Julio Formenti. I'm now also going to present uh, later on. See, jo Jolio, I think I will also turn my camera have, off. Mm -hmm. Jolio, I, I think you have a weak signal also, so there is some lagging. off is it better yes Jolio that we lost the Jolio already Let's try again. Sorry yes. about that. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah. So today we would like to talk about the um, uh, Vertebrate Genomes Project Pipeline uh, that developed as part of a collaboration between the Vertebrate Genomes Project and the European Reference Genome Atlas. And um, I'm going to the pipeline, and hopefully uh, we will see also some examples uh, of uh, data sets that were generated uh, as part of the Africa Biogenome Project, uh, and we will comment on them. Well, first of all, uh, in order to generate high quality reference genomes, you need uh, to use at, at present different technologies. So you need to have uh, data types of, from different technologies and complement them uh, of the genome, uh, the species really. If we're talking about vertebrates, uh, they all have some level of complexity that needs to be addressed. So for the current uh, version of the Julio, I think I don't, we lost you again, I think. Oh I'm sorry, I don't know what's going yeah. on. Me <laughs> yeah, as well, I don't know. Can, can you try, uh, can you hear Julio? Me now? Yeah, yeah so, Julio, so, could you please try to log out and log in again? Yeah, Sometimes I think Julio's internet is not, is uh, 
kind of uh, cracking. So, Julia, if you want to try okay. to... Yeah, your internet doesn't look that... Um, yeah. Is it change, maybe? Something... Go two minutes. Give me two minutes. Yeah. Okay, take care of that. Minutes. Sorry, everyone, just we wait Jolio to log in again. So in the time we wait for Jolio to log in, I see Shakuaka is still 
raise your hand. Do you still have a question to ask or? Okay. I already asked uh, my question on the chat group. I can still make it a little bit clearer this time. Like, is it possible that as the Galaxy web development goes on, some tools are lost along, along the way based on what I experienced last week? I had a variant calling activity. Uh, I generated a VCF file using the BC tools call. Then I needed to use BC tools count to count the variants, but I couldn't find I couldn't find any alternative that could do that. Yeah. So that's my my question. Okay, so maybe like Nidal, and we will try to reply to your answer in the open discussion session. So Jolio, he returned. Jolio, can you can you unmute yourself now? I'm back. Um, not sure if this is better. Uh, I will ask uh, my collaborator, Linnell, who is also on the call, to share the slides. And if uh, I cannot <laughs> uh, have a stable connection, I'm really sorry, but then Linnell can um, jump in. Thank that you. That is much better to write. All right. So um, is it? OK, I will stop my video as well, just in case. All right, so um, again, as I was saying, we have multiple technologies that are needed to uh, achieve uh, the quality that we uh, want for our reference genomes. And in particular for the car, we have three, um, one is the, has now this, uh, uh, method that generates uh, so called the circular very, very high quality. There's very few errors. They're very, still very long uh, in terms of read length, uh, usually around 20 to 20. So, sorry, I think, um, uh, Julio, so I don't know. Hello. Uh, so, Julio. Julio. Yes. I think, uh, is there someone who, who has uh, maybe the slide that can do it on your behalf? Because we, I, I don't know if I'm the only one. I could barely hear yeah, what you're saying. Yeah, me as so, well. I think for um, so is there a way we can do this? Because uh, otherwise, it may not be so those things. So is, is there a way we can actually, because I could barely hear you. Again, I think it's the internet, I think. Uh, what do people think? Yeah, for me. Yeah, so yeah. Too. One second, I will, I will unmute so in your head. And okay. Yeah, so if, if, yeah, if, yeah, let's, let's have uh, whoever have a better internet could please do it. Yeah, Leonel, please unmute yourself and go ahead, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes Leonel. Uh, if Is you don't it... mind, really, just introduce <laughs> yourself and please go ahead, you know. Hi, so I'm Linnell. I'm one of Julio's colleagues at the Vertebrate Genome Lab. Is my connection okay or should I slow down for lab? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. okay. Awesome. Um, so I am in charge of a lot of the assemblies and just running them on Galaxy. I've gotten a bit of a local Galaxy instance running using our HPC. And yeah, that's basically my role on the bioinformatics team. Julio and his um, a lot of our senior colleagues have developed the pipeline and uh, wrangled together the tools to create high quality assemblies. And I came onto the project just to get a lot of our backlog done, get these assemblies out and available for public use. So the first part of this talk is going to be going over the pipeline and how it's implemented in Galaxy. And the second part is going to highlight the speckled mouse bird and boils beaked blind snake assemblies, which were 
which I had run using the Galaxy interface and workflows. And those are two Africa BP um, species. I believe. So as Julia was saying, our pipeline makes use of mainly three different technologies to generate a high quality assembly. The first one is, can you see my cursor? My mouse yes. cursor? Okay, cool. Yeah. So the first one's gonna be your hi-fi long reads from PacBio. And we have two sets of scaffolding data. That's going to be the bio nano optical maps, which generate um, long optical maps from ultra high molecular weight DNA to get a like landscape picture of how the genome looks. And also high C sequencing, which is a chromatin capture technology that um, allows you to link distant regions together based on how they were um, located together in the chromatin space, like within the cell. So, and this is just an illustration kind of how we, so this is the genome on the top, like as how it exists in reality. And this is our bioinformatic ways of trying to capture that and report on that. So we have our sequencing reads. These are gonna be the pack bio long reads and their overlaps are assembled into contigs, which are further scaffolded together. Like the areas that the contigs weren't able to capture they get sexy, they are connected using scaffolding. So we have our optical maps and our high C, high C reads, allowing us to reach a chromosome level scaffold, a scaffolded assembly. So this slide is just kind of illustrating further what our reads look like, what our data looks like. Um, so this is a schematic of our pipeline as it is now. So the two assemblies, so we recently moved towards using Hi-Fi ASM, which is what we use to assemble the Hi-Fi reads. It has a couple modes available. Before we used to use the primary and alternate one, and now we have been using the one that has integrated Hi-C phasing. So you can get properly phased, um, um, properly phased assemblies. So you're not switching between maternal and um, paternal haplotypes within the same contig. Um, so on the left side, you'll have the different high fiasm modes that are available. The regular one has no sort of phasing. That's the standard primary alternate type assembly that, um, that a lot of uh, people are usually used to at this point. Then the high C mode, which I had just touched on, and trio mode, which has parental short read data in order to phase properly. Um, so sometimes we do need to do purging, usually for the primary and alternate mode, because we have been running that with hi fi as internal purging turned off. So we will have to purge that one after, but usually hi c and Trio do not need to be purged, but it can, it can vary. And then after that, your contigs or your purge contigs will continue to scaffolding by BioNano if you have that data and then by Salsa or YAS, which are two different high C information scaffolders. And then after that, we have recently introduced a new decontamination step to remove potential bacterial contaminants and to find like the mitochondria because they don't want those when you submit it for NCBI um, to the SBI archives. MitoHiFi can also assemble the mitochondrial genome from your bio reads into a nice linearized um, assembly, which you can submit separately to NCBI. And there's also a manual curation step at the end, which is at right now for the VGP mostly happening at the Welcome Sanger Institute in Cambridge, but we are moving towards trying to do a little more of it in-house. That's not really my specialty, so I will not talk about that part during this presentation though. So this is just um, illustrating those high quality um, CCS reads that Julio had mentioned before his internet completely broke out on him. So this is a hi-fi read schematic. It goes over the same regions multiple times to generate a circular consensus, allowing you to reach long, um, long read lengths that span along a longer part of your genome and also having high quality because you're taking a consensus of multiple passes. And this is just an assembly um, a schematic of high fiasm's assembly process straight from their paper. They, you have your input high fi reads and they, there's a first error correction step because there's 99, over 99.9% .9 accuracy for high fi but that still does leave a little bit of room for error. So high fiasm will do error correction and create a string graph to um, 
to try to walk that graph to generate your assembly. So these green, well, these green number, numbers would represent the homozygous regions present on both haplotypes. And this bubble would be where the haplotypes differ. So in the instance of the primary and alternate assembly, usually it just walks, picks one path, and it has the homozygous regions and one heterozygous representation in a primary. And then the other like haplotype gets sent to the alternate assembly. For a phase assembly, you could use complementary data such as high C information from the same individual or parental short reads to phase it. And you'll get more complete haplotype one and haplotype two assemblies. They're more complete because you see haplotype two will have homozygous regions as well. Um, so this is just describing our bio nano optical map. So optical maps label the DNA at specific motifs using um, fluor fluorescent labeling. And it gives you a very good linkage information, which can figure out where contacts should be placed relative to each other. It can fix joins that were incorrect, but we don't have scaffolding for this, so it's fine. Um, and it can help you estimate the gap size between your contacts. So bio nano is very useful for that and also for finding like structural variants if you're using it for stuff that you already have the genome for. Um, and scaffolding with high C data. Yes, it's chromatin confirmation to find like topological domains within the, within the cell. And it informs you like which DNA sequences were close to each other in the 3D space of the cell. So those would likely be close to each other as well in your assembly because they were probably closer in linear space if they were bunched up together as well. So these, that's just an overview of our um, of the technology we use for this, for our high quality assemblies, which take place on Galaxy. And a lot of this is mentioned earlier today, but so I might skip over some of the um, pitching why Galaxy is a great way to go. But just to recap, it's scalable workflows and they're really reproducible because we have all our workflows available on GitHub and you can download them and run them on your data. So that's about as reproducible as it gets. Um, you can use an existing inter, you can use an existing instance such as the EU one or the one in Tunisia or the one in Australia or the or US, or you can install it and run it locally, which is what we are, we're moving towards it. And it has a great graphical user interface, which is really handy for anyone who has tried to run things on command line. You'll know what a difference it can make to have um, a more easy graspable graph user interface. And you don't need to know how to program or anything to use these like drag and drop tools. So yes, these are just some, it's just gonna be a few screenshots of how Galaxy looks so right now. This is what the histories tab looks like. You'll have the outputs of your previous jobs. So these are just um, like, this would be a summary image of Busco from this um, Zebrafish assembly. They're all greens, they're all successful, as Nidal had mentioned earlier. earlier. Um, yes, yeah, so this is just showing the different colors. If you're waiting for resources to run your job, your job is queued and it's this gray color with a little time, with a little clock symbol. And if it's running, it's yellow. Um, and succeeded is this green color that we saw before. So another good, so another good part of Galaxy is you can import from public repositories. So genome, our genome arc is actually linked at least to the EU one, I believe, to all of them. But I've been using an EU, so that's where my knowledge is from. So you can just import all these data, all these raw data, straight into it, and that's how I've been running the assemblies. Um, so I don't need to download them to my computer or anything. It just goes all straight to um, the EU servers. So. Yes, this is just a more in-depth view of the pipeline. I might skim over some of the slides in the interest of time, but this is what our old pipeline um, schematic looked like. It's, sim it's similar to the previous one. So the first step is that this one just really highlights all the QC steps we offer at each step of the pipeline. And um, these QC metrics are all generated automatically by the workflows. So you don't have to worry about running it and you're like, oh, I forgot to run the QC. I don't know if I can go to the next step yet. It'll be there and ready for you to assess. So the first QC step is genome scope and um, creation of a KMER database. It's just to profile your genome based off of your raw reads. It helps you estimate the genome size that you would 
um, based off your reads and your heterozygosity and like your coverage for that genome. And it's a good check because you can know if your estimated genome size in your data matches what you're estimating based on literature. For instance, if you're sequencing a bird, which is expected to be 1.3 gigabases, and you come up with only 600 megabases, something is probably wrong, you need more coverage, et cetera, et cetera. So just as an example of the Galaxy workflows, this is what a lo workflow looks like um, under the hood. So these steps, these are all the inputs that the user like inputs into the workflow. And these jobs are all run sequentially as a workflow behind the scenes. So the user will then only see the outputs that are desired from the workflow. You don't have to babysit the jobs and make sure that they're running properly. They will run sequentially when you invoke your workflow. Um, yes, user chooses inputs here, Galaxy outputs these. And so this is just saying, um, I can send these links later on or share them after the fact, but all our workflows are available on Delphine's GitHub. So you can download them and import them to your Galaxy. Yes. Sorry, uh, Lino, uh, can you also please send us the, the slide itself? Yes, of I course. That, yes. that would be that would be helpful. Yeah, so we can. Yeah, yeah. So I, I did I did include um, an email address to send. Oh, Julio mm -hmm. also knows. So if you send it to that email okay. address, then the relevant people within Africa people will see it, and of course we can always share it as well. Okay, awesome. I'll send those after Thank the you. presentation. Sure. Um, okay, so this is just showing you what you will see when you actually run the workflow. So this is where you would put in your high fight data, your pack bio data, and just like some metadata about your species. So it's name, species ID would be like for our VGP IDs, for example, our, the speckled mouse world later, Coleus triatus is B colster four, but this is just basic metadata. And you can change some of the parameters. We usually use like camera length of 21, Ploidy will be two for diploids. This is just to illustrate what the user will see when running a workflow. It's a lot more friendly to try to um, wrestle with the command line interface. Um, so the output of genome scope is a genome profile by way of a camera spectrum. And it also shows you some stats about your um, genome profile. So the spectrum will reflect the complexity of the genome. Haploid genomes will typically have one peak, like the one, this is the genome profile of yeast. So this peak would be where the, also the coverage for this genome is. So it's about 30 X coverage here. And then diploid genomes are supposed to, they, the heterozygous ones will have two distinct peaks. This would be the haploid peak, and this would be the diploid peak. So you'd also can infer that there's about 35x diploid coverage for this zebra finch. But so what's well, something to note is that if you have a highly homozygous species, uh, highly homozygous um, individual, then, um, or low heterozygous individual, such as this rhino here, there's the haploid peak can be very low. So it might end up looking closer to the um, yeast one, but you can still see a little shoulder that would represent haploid coverage here. It's just that a lot of the genome is homozygous, so there's higher um, diploid peak instead. And you can also, the most important thing I usually like to see outside of the graph is the estimated genome length. You'll see this one is about almost just shy of three gigabases, which uh, tracks for a mammal. The zebra finch is about one gig tracks for a bird. And so that's how you can also like um, assess whether you are on the right track and ready to continue on with your assembly. The first step of the assembly is going to be hi fiism to assemble those hi fi reads. So, this, um, this slide, these slides are going to go in depth about the primary alternate way of running the pipeline, which is what we were using up until like about a month ago. And it's still useful, especially if you don't have high C data. We just we generate high C for all our individuals. So that's why we've moved to using that one. But it's still very useful to know about the primary alternate method. Because um, that is high fiasm's default. So when you run high fiasm, you'll receive your primary contents and your alternate contents, which is the part that's capturing those heterozygous regions in, as shown in the previous high fiasm schematic. And then what we do after that, there can still be some retained um, like false duplication in the 
primary uh, in the primary assembly. And so those parts, because maybe they look so different that it thinks it's a whole different part of the genome instead of just being a um, haplotype. So when you run purge dupes, it removes those haplotypes from the primary and adds them to your alternate. You'll see they're adding here. And then your purge primary will go on to scaffolding. And then the combination of your alternate contigs plus your haplotypes will be purged again. And that will create your like final alternate assembly, which would be submitted to um, NCBI in our case. So we, do, we don't scaffold the alternate. We only scaffold the primary. That's the takeaway from this slide. And this is just to illustrate like how much of the workflow is our hidden yeah. under the hood galaxy. Yeah, this is the high fi as a <laughs> workflow. Could you imagine like having to run this or like um like pipe everything on your own? So it's very handy to just have that like uh, workflow invocation and just feed it your data, some parameters and have a nice um, assembly out of the um, out of the workflow. Um, so this is just showing the what, what you actually would see when you run the workflow. You can have the um, lineage for Busco. It's just a lot of this right now is um, just for the quote QC metrics, some parameters you might want to set. But the most important thing is just the um, tech bio reads and some more metadata type of organism. This is just for the QC, like Quas and Busco, they need these parameters. They like, they usually don't, they don't change when you're running your vertebrates. Um, but yeah, so much more simplified than trying to run these steps individually. Um, yeah, inputs continued. Yes, you also need to, so when you run them all in a history, you have access to your outputs from previous workflows. So the output from the Merrill database workflow, which was run to generate genome scope, you put that into the hi fi -ism workflow because Mercury uh, requires these as well. So you can just chain everything together. It's really easy. So Mercury um, is a QC tool that uses KMERS to try and evaluate your, um, uses the KMERS from your sequencing reads to try to evaluate how your assemblies are in terms of completeness and quality. And so, yeah, compares your assembly KMERS to the read set KMERS. So this, so what, the one that's uncolored, you might notice looks a lot like the diploid, um, diploid genome scope plot. And Mercury will, because this is just a read, so it's essentially the diploid genome scope plot. You'll have your haploid peak and diploid peak. And then the copy number plot tries to sh um, takes your two assemblies together. So in this case, it considers your primary and your alternate assembly and colors these, re these cameras according to how often they're found. So the haploid peak, all these are found at one copy, um, at one copy across your two assemblies, which makes sense because they're haploid. And the diploid peak is found twice across your two assemblies. So it'd be once in a, usually once in the primary and once in the alternate. And then, um, so then these spectra assembly ones look at each assembly separately. So it can, it has the, this diploid peak is shared between your two assemblies, which makes sense because it's almost zygous regions. And then it'll color the, part, the haploid parts that are shared, that are only present in one assembly and not the other one. Um, so we just run this after each after high fiasm and after purging to get a to get an idea of how the assemblies are looking. So the you can see the difference that purging makes by looking at the mercury plots. So for here before purging. The, so the spectra, the copy number will look the same basically, but the assembly ones will look much different. So in before purging, this indicates that a lot of a lot of the KMERS are only in um, your primary haplotype. There's very little shared and there's just very little that's only in the alternate. And then after purging, when we remove the haplotypes from the primary and add them to the alternate, that leads to a lot more shared between the two assemblies, and also a lot more, um, a lot more of the heterozygosity represented properly in the alternate haplotype. So this is just a lot more balanced set of assemblies. This is what you'd want to see in your mercury plots after purging. Um, doo -doo -doo. Let's skip this for now. It also gives you a QV and completeness metrics, which can be useful. So I'll just highlight completeness for now in the interest of time. Completeness is relative to the KMERS from your read set. So it's 
ideally you should be having most of those represented in your assembly because the reads are what you're using to make the assembly. So before purging, the primary is 95% complete and the alternate is only 17% complete, complete relative to your reads. But after purging, you'll see it has, the alternate's a lot better at 75 and the primary has gone down a bit, but that's expected because you're removing some false duplication that shouldn't be in it anyway. And overall, the two of them are still at 90, about net, over 99% completeness. And then, yes, another, another um, QC we report is Busco. So it checks for assembly completeness by a gene content using what it using evolutionarily expected genes that you predict will be there just in one copy. So, oops, wrong slide. Um, so just to highlight what you'd see before and after purging for Busco, before purging on the primary assembly, almost half of these that are complete are duplicated. So after purging, when you're removing all the purge duplicates, you've gotten rid of all of these false duplications. They're now in the alternate where they should be. So this is really the type of QC check you'd want to see before and after purging. And our other tool is QOS, which just calculates standard summary statistics for the assembly, such as content, how many contexts are all, there are, the genome size, and N50, which is a contiguity metric um, that's just standardly reported. Um, yes, this is just showing what it looks like for a contact level assembly. Here's your number here, your total length, and 50 other statistics such as GC content, um, gap content. There's none here because we're on contact level right now. Let's see, yep. Oh, and you'll just see, this is the highlighted difference before and after purging as well. Before purging, the genome size for this bird is about two gig, which is incorrect. As we saw before, it's expected to be one gig so after purging, it is now down to like 1.1 gig, so a lot closer to what we'd expect it to be. Because we've removed, it all, you'll see in the Mercury plot, it had like a whole second copy of the genome, and purging has fixed that. Um, this is an example of the out, we have, so Julio de developed a new tool called GFA stats, which is kind of reporting a lot of what Quas does as well, but can also handle um, the GFA format, which is the actual sequence graph out of IFIASM, so it um, reports some additional statistics, such as um, paths, edges, connected components, and dead ends, which are, so these are graph-specific ones. So these are handy for if you're analyzing straight out of um, the GFA, straight out of IFIASM. It also has average scaffold and average contact length and like base composition. So we've been also introduced this tool in our workflows. Do, do, do. So the next step is scaffolding. So this is the bio nano scaffolding. This happens on the again, your purged contigs. So this is what the input, the um, workflow invocation looks like. You'll want your output from your previous workflow. So those would be your purge contigs in this instance or normal contigs here. Right. Sorry, Linnea. Yes. Uh, so how many, how many of these processes is uh, plug and play? Or do you have to, because it looks like there are multiple process and does it mean that internally that, um, I mean, I'm just wondering how this mm -hmm. works. How many times do you have to upload the data or is it just upload it? And I think most people want to uh, know this as well on the call. Yeah, so you would upload all your data like essentially once, but then, so the workflows, there's four of them, the HiFi, the genome profiling, HiFi as and bio nano and high C. So it's modular. Cause for instance, for some of our assemblies, you don't have bio nano data. So we don't okay. want to run that one like all in all together. Yes. So you can just, it's plug and play with regard okay. to the individual workflows. Yes. All right, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, okay. yeah that makes sense. Yeah. So this is the input for BioNano. You have your optical map and just some other stats and stuff here. And this is, BioNano doesn't have very pretty output. It just gives you a hybrid scaffold report. So your original bio nano and genome map statistics, and then this is your hybrid scaffold. So like when it actually puts your contigs against the bio nano um, genome map and generates the hybrid scaffold, this is the statistics of that. Also, some sequences don't, some contigs don't end up scaffolded. So that's this what this final count is. It's your hybrid scaffold plus the non-scaffolded contigs. Um, 
And then the last step is the last workflow, at least for now, is the salsa scaffolding with high C data. And yeah, so this is just again showing how the workflow looks like under the hood. You need to map the high C reads to them and then create contact maps and then scaffold it and then create another contact map. So these this is what the workflow invocation looks like. You have your high C forward reads and your high C reverse reads and your assembly, which can be either the context or your bio nano scaffolded one. So yeah, as I was saying before, sometimes you don't have bio nano data. So we just have to scaffold the context occasionally um, and your restriction enzyme sequences, which were used for the actual high C reaction. So the main QC out of uh, salsa and yas out of this high C scaffolding step is a contact map. So it's basically a heat map showing the um, contacts between two regions of your um, of your linear genome that you're feeding into it. So for instance, these numbers are just for illustrative purposes. So the axes are like this would be chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, four, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll see here that there's like kind of a box of um, high contacts among chromosome one. So this makes sense because this would likely be localized together in the chromatin space. So this is before high C scaffolding and this is after high C scaffolding. What you really look for is a decrease in off diagonal signal. So this is an example of it. This is saying, for instance, that chromosome seven and chromosome five are interacting. So maybe there's like a misjoin or like these, these two should be joined together. And that's what salsa should ideally be doing. You'll see it has no more um, off diagonal signal present. And yes, that's just an explanation of these contact maps. And these are generated automatically by the workflow as well for high C. Okay, so that was a big, fast overview of the pipeline. And these were some examples of the genomes used, so genomes assembled in Galaxy using this new Hi-Fi pipeline, just the zebra finch, chub mackerel, and Eurasian shrew, just to illustrate that the pipeline works across a variety of taxa. And um, you can see an improvement in in um, N50 and like, so just contiguity after scaffolding steps across all of these, even the fish, which doesn't have bio nano data on it. Um, yeah, that was what this takeaway was. Further resources and notes. Yeah, we have a couple, tra there's, there's still more after this, wait. <laughs> we have a couple of um, training tutorials available now. I can also share those links later. Um, they go over how to run our pipeline on a example data of yeast, just so it's like quick. I think that's what Nidra was uploading earlier today. But um, so there's that. There's also one that shows how to run the workflows themselves. Um, we've used the pipeline mainly in vertebrate animals as our lab's name would suggest, but the same pipeline has worked for assembling insects locally. Um, and yeah, we've assembled a few insects. Olivia has done a couple of mosquitoes and a spider. And so we're maintaining and improving the pipeline so um, continuously. So we're, we're aiming to include graph assembly graph integration and Julio's developing of GFA sets was the first, uh, our first step towards that. And as I mentioned in the Schematic at the beginning, we do have a manual, not a manual, a um, automated decontamination step that's being added right now. It's not like ready yet. It's not in the workflows yet. That's why I didn't cover it today, but it'll like stay tuned for that part. So uh, yeah, that's the overview of our pipeline and how it's implemented. So I'm gonna just quickly show some assembly stats for the speckled mouse bird and the boil's beak blind snake. Uh, oops, where am I? Okay. No, what happened? I clicked the link. <laughs> Can you see it still? Okay, let's see. Sounds good. Okay. These are just the quick acknowledgements. Yes, I can send a lecture afterwards. Yeah. Um, so these are quick acknowledgements. The rest of the whole vertebrate genome lab and everyone has gone towards developing the pipeline and also generating a lot of the data for this. And the Galaxy team has been super helpful and instrumental in getting this pipeline working on their infrastructure and using their tools. They've installed a lot of 
they've installed a lot of the tools in the uh, that we need, like specifically, just like once you requested it too. So yes, the first assembly I'm going to go over is the speckled mouse bird, Coleus triatus. I ran this using the high fiasm high C workflow. So it'll the QC is the same QC tools, but um, the expected results will be a little bit different because it'll be it'll um, give you a high, a phase assembly out of this right out of the box. So this is the first the genome scope, the first step. You'll see that it is somewhat heterozygous, not as much as the zebra finch, but still um, a decent amount. And the expected genome size is 1.1 gigabases, which is what we would expect for a bird. And so these are the mercury plots from high fias and high C. You'll see that they are a lot neater right out of the bat, right out right off the bat compared to primary and alternate. Because high fias and high C prevents that false duplication from before. So it prevents, it eliminates the need for purging usually. So you'll have a more complete half one and half two assembly. They're sharing the homozygous regions as expected. And then the heterozygous regions are each represented in assembly one and assembly two. So these are these overlap over each other. So you'll see that assembly two is a bit taller than assembly one. This is likely due to one of them getting the sex chromosome. So one of them probably has the Z um, chromosome. And these are just the individual mercury plots, it's fine. Uh, completeness metrics are good. It's over 99% across both haplotypes. Um, and the BUSCO results are you see like no, no um, duplicated genes. So that's good. There's no need for purging. And again, this missing content from HEP1 is probably due to, so the latest BUSCO gene set for some reason contains genes that are present on sex chromosomes. So it's probably picking up these as missing, but it's not supposed, to, it, it's fine if it's not there because this one just doesn't have the sex chromosome. It'll, those are partitioned um, like separately into different haplotypes. So these are also the standard just um, statistics and the total length for both of them matches what we'd expect from the genome length based off of genome, genome scope. It, they're both about 1.1 or 1.2 gigabases. And a good contiguity, the N50 for the contigs is about 20, 22 megabases. So that's, that's still very good. Um, and not a bunch of contigs, 320, so a manageable amount. And after BioNano, you'll see the contig number has gone down. This should really say scaffolds because you've scaffolded some contigs together. So the amount of pieces in your FASTA, the amount of sequences in your FASTA are gonna be less, um, fewer. And the total lag will be changing, but you'll see the N50. Did I highlight this? One? They'll see the N50 has gone up from 200 megabases to 500. And then um, these are your high C contact maps before salsa scaffolding. So it's still really clean um, even before it, but salsa will just improve it, joins up, takes, takes these diag off diagonal signal, and cleans it up a little bit. And so this is what gets sent off to manual curation for us. And these are just the final statistics for HAP1 and final statistics for HAP2. And yes, that was, yeah, so that's the speckled, speckled mouse bird. Yes, it's going off to curation probably next week once I get it all exported. And the next one I had to feature was the um, Boyle's Beaked Blind Snake. So this assembly, I, I believe, doesn't have any scaffolding data, but it still looks really good out of high fias. Um, so since we don't have scaffolding data, that means there's no high C data. So I couldn't run high fias and high C on it. So this is going to be featuring high fias in primary and alternate mode, like I went over during the main, during the first part of the presentation. So those, these statistics, these um, QC plots would look similar to what I showed earlier. Um, Here's just the genome scope, just to familiarize ourselves with what to expect. So the genome size is 1.6 gigabases. Sounds fine for a reptile. And before purging, this is what it, the stats were out of um, typhiasm. So there's a big amount of duplication in it and the completeness is um, like almost 98 for the primary and then very low for the alternate. 
and then the mercury plots for before purging, you'll see our super imbalance for the assembly because they're not sharing a lot. And there is a lot of stuff that's only a lot of diploid um, gamers that are present only in your primary when they really should be present in both. And the alternate has, um, is just super tiny. So not ideal. And so this is why we would purge and move these um, haplotics from the primary into the alternate. So pre-purging, yes, this is just individual ones, that's fine. Um, some pre-purge statistics, also the total length for the primary is like almost three gigabases. So that's twice of what we expected. Um, hold on, was my mic? No, okay, I'm fine. Is, so that's about twice what we'd expect, which makes sense because there's like two copies of the genome at this point. And then post purging, you'll see it's, this goes improved. We don't have all those duplicated genes in there. And the completeness of the, of the alternate has been brought up from like 18 to 80, so a lot better. And yeah, the assembly plot looks a lot more like what we'd expect. There's, you have a lot of them shared. There's, um, the alternate has is representing a lot more of the heterozygous regions. And so purging isn't as perfect as it would be for high, fat, high C phasing or trio phasing. So there are still some homozygous regions that remain only in the primary, but this is still very good for a primary alternate assembly, I would say, like without any additional phasing data. And yep, the final stats at the end of purging, the primary is 1.7 gig basis, so a lot closer to the 1.6 gig estimate as before. And um, I'll, yeah, it's brought up the alternate to like 1.5 as well. N50 was seven megs, so still pretty good for these reptile genomes. And that was the last slide. So I'm gonna go back to the acknowledgements real quick, which was in the middle of the presentation. Okay. That was, I, I can have time for questions, I think. Julio has also joined well, in case there's any questions yeah. for him. Don't, don't worry, we have like really, we have plenty of time for questions. Okay, I wasn't sure like what the time like limit was. So I was like- Yeah, because we have like, you know, we specify like two hours frame actually for you guys to mm -hmm. present and like really you will have question and, you know. Uh, anyway, thanks so much Ninel actually to, mm -hmm for the presentation and it's tipped in and save us. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. No problem, I hope it was helpful. Yeah, it was really great, thanks so much. So now please, if you have any question to Daniel or Jodio, please go ahead. And in the same time, I will post in a chat box, in a chat box uh, the link to the form for the evaluation form, please go ahead and fill the evaluation form. Oh, can you unmute Julia? Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think now I'm using my cell phone, so hopefully it's actually better. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you so much, Linnell, and sorry again, everyone, uh, for the connectivity issue, but I think Linnell did an excellent job to uh, walk you through the pipeline. Of course, uh, I mean, if you have never done genome assembly or you're not familiar with um, the tools that were presented, I could take some time to uh, get used to that, uh, but uh, the tutorials that Linnell um, showed you, I mean, they're really, really useful. And particularly the, the more in-depth one is really guiding everyone step-by-step step, explaining the, you know, why we get some results, what to look at, the, the logic behind it. So uh, I'm pretty sure it will be really, really useful uh, to, to get um, used to the pipeline. And then yeah, you yeah. can on your own. Yeah, before before people they start to step in for the question, I, I will I have one actually. So I'm sure. wondering for uh, for the cracking uh, cracking contamination. Yeah, I'm I'm wondering so why you don't go for something like blob tools since I know the Sanger people they really and Tree of Life people they really go for it. So maybe I can answer that. So the the 
Blob Toolkit's uh, it, it's a very nice tool, and um, the problem is that we want something that is automated, while Blob Toolkit's is actually a more of a sort of visualization tool that yeah. can potentially allow it to disentangle some of the you know contaminants from the rest of the assembly, but it will not give you a, like a straight answer. Okay, this is what we think it's contaminant. Get rid of it. I know you need to visualize. You now they have these plots of uh, GC content uh, and coverage, uh, and so uh, yeah, then it's really up to the user. Uh, but I mean, if you have time for manually curate your assembly, then it makes sense to uh, run something like Blob Toolkits to uh, to you know further refine your results. Yeah, it makes sense. So we have a couple of questions, like other questions. So. Diego, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you very much. And congratulations for this uh, excellent presentation. I would also like to thank uh, the organizer of this uh, workshop. Now my question, uh, uh, I am from Senegal. And uh, my question is, uh, which pipeline is more accurate if you have, for example, a tetraploid genome or heptaploid genome, which pipeline is more accurate to, to use? Thank you. So I can provide a quick answer, then you know, I can also jump in. But um, most of the assembly tools that have been developed over the years uh, are, you know, always developed with the human data in mind because there is a lot more usage for that. So for uh, essentially deployed uh, species. Uh, having said that, now that the technology allows us to generate very high quality data, high quality assemblies, uh, people have uh, you know, more and more interest in, um, in more complex genomes. And so for instance, uh, HIFASM appears to start to support uh, the um, assembly of tetraploids. Uh, having said that, I mean, what really happens is that uh, if you have more than one haplotype, you probably lose some of them. It doesn't mean that your assembly is not going to be generated. Um, yeah, so we know if you want to comment. No, I was just going to say um, basically what you had said as well. There's been some people using HIFIASM for um, polyploid genomes. There's been a tetraploid data recently published on oil available in bioarchive. And I think for haplotype separation, they had to use like um, offspring data to kind of separate out the actual haplotypes cleanly. But there's, um, there's a lot of, this issue comes up a lot more with um, plant genome, so I'd probably look towards labs specializing in that. They'd have a lot more uh, resources or experience about um, what pipelines or how to make these pipelines fit that sort of, that sort of data and specimens a lot better. Okay, so another question from Sadiq. Please, Sadiq, go ahead. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, Julio and Nilian. That's really interesting and enjoyable to, uh, uh, Presentation and I'm quite interested in in the purging step, particularly. Uh, I mean, HIFASM does have uh, the purging parameter, like from light to several purging, but but it's not clear what that would mean. But I'm curious to know uh, whether you're just generating the default HIFASM, uh, then you do the purge dupe for each of the primary and the the alternate assembly, or are we just playing around those parameters like the, I mean, you know, those parameters like the purging or so they have also like similarity or camera value. And how are you dealing with, particularly when you are fine tuning your assembly before going into like further uh, cleaning up the, um, the assembly? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Julia can speak a bit more about the history of looking at it, because in the past, I think you were saying the, I think he had said that the purging and high fiasm wasn't super reliable at the time. So our pipeline had been using purge dupes as an external one. And recently <clears throat> we're going to test um, the current internal purging and high fiasm and compare it to the external one. But also at that time, high fiasm high C 
we like switched to that at that point, like kind of at the same time. So we haven't followed up super thoroughly on that, but I think it does provide similar results as the, um, as the internal purging in high fiasm, but I haven't tested the specific, pur- like there's three different levels, light purging, medium, and then like highly aggressive purging. So I haven't tested like the, the differences between those um, in, internally in high fiasm yet. I don't know if Julia wants to and type in more. And complement, yeah, yeah that, just to say that at the end of the day, it all comes down to evaluation. So there is no recipe that necessarily will work out of the box on a known genome. So what you really want to do is uh, if you um, look at the results now from QC, particularly all these uh, spectra chimer plots that we now uh, showed, uh, they look suspicious, then that's where you should stop and try, you know, uh, fine tuning. Okay, so I hope this really ask you answer your question. So actually, please before to if you have another question to Jolio, Leniel, or other speakers for today, please go ahead. And also please I remind you to go and fill the evaluation form. So another question from Joshua. Please Joshua unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello. Yes, Jilo, yeah. thanks, thanks for the good presentation. No, my concern is just with the, there's a, a recent uh, package that is, that was uh, developed by Gene Myers. This is the first K2. It has not really been uh, taken to the Bioconda and uh, it's not yet in the galaxy, but it's kind of the best of, uh, for camera counting. So. And I know you've also done some work on it. What can you comment? Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we we work um, uh, regularly with uh, with Gene. Uh, yeah. <laughs> most far in September last year, uh, when he was uh, working on FastK. Um, I would say, I mean, for for the usage cases that are part of the pipeline. Uh, it may, would make sense to integrate it, but only for efficiency because it's faster. I mean, hence the name, I would say. <laughs> it's faster than uh, than other camera counters like uh, Muriel. Uh, one problem, one challenging about this is that um, when you want to interrogate a Muriel, da- sorry, a camera database, uh, usually tools are, uh, you know, depend on specific databases. So if you're using Mercury, for instance, Mercury has been engineered uh, to work with the Merrill uh, databases. That's the Kimmer counter that we, we use in the pipeline. While um, uh, switching to FastK, of course, would require some re tool. In fact, uh, Gene uh, Myers himself uh, uh, also to showcase uh, FastK did that uh, already. So he, he did um, essentially re engineer um, Mercury to use FastK. Uh, the problem, I mean, let's the, the, say the additional layer of complexity here is that then we should also uh, re-engineer our pipeline to use the Mercury version that uh, uses FastK. So basically, that's something we have um, uh, started, but not yet uh, uh, done. And again, at this point, it would be um, a factor of uh, efficiency, which of course, I mean, makes sense to take into account uh, in the uh, uh, in um, in, a, in a like an infrastructure like Galaxy, where you know com- uh, you depend on the compute uh, sometimes. I mean, if you have an install it locally, you will depend on the compute available in the in the uh, uh, Galaxy Pulsar system. But um, I, I would say it would be more interesting, even or even more interesting, if um, or we could start to think about new ways uh, to. Uh, evaluate our assemblies and for instance fast k as opposed to other camera counters has some interesting features that could allow that but that's also uh, a, a active um, area of uh, let's say r and d uh, maybe I, I just to connect to this uh, uh, to a, a question that was uh, made at the very beginning um, so there is um essentially one of the aims of the galaxy is to try to uh, relief the, the user from the burden of having to decide about resources. So I think there was a question early on that 
uh, was uh, about the amount of resources that are available. Uh, there are you know, hundreds of uh, nodes as part of the EU uh, uh, infrastructure. There are hundreds of nodes about the US infrastructure. Uh, but the, the thing is that when it comes to specific jobs, then there are essentially two internal uh, ways to um, determine the amount of resources that that particular job will receive. So there is a sort of a hard coded amount, like you have, uh, let's say, uh, eight CPUs for this particular uh, camera counting job. And this is something that is specified based on a sort of a uh, rule of thumb um, uh, from users. Uh, in more sophisticated cases where, for instance, uh, you know, you have a very large genome, so you want to have more resources so that it runs uh, faster, or you need a lot of memory for some reason, uh, then um, Galaxy has been uh, engineered so that basically, depending on some uh, input parameters, we will decide how many resources to allocate. But again, the, the idea behind Galaxy is also to try to sort of uh, hide uh, this additional complexity from the users. Uh, in our experience, you, you're, you're getting a decent amount of resources. So if you don't plan to assemble 100 genomes in the next uh, in, a, in a week, let's say, uh, you get all you all you need. And then at some point, now when you have your own uh, uh, high high performance computing resources, then you can uh, scale up uh, as much as you want. Yes, I'm sure. You. I have actually another question. So I'm wondering if there is a standalone version of the pipeline available then to run it locally rather than in Galaxy. Lina, mm -hmm. you want me to, to respond? Run, I so, thought this is addressing the containerization, which right, I thought yeah, so, uh, about. So, yeah. so we, the way we uh, conceive this is to try to um, avoid having multiple versions of the need to be maintained in parallel. Uh, so you can run Galaxy locally uh, on your computer <laughs> if you want, or on an HPC. That's not a problem. You just need to install it. Uh, but then um, we are not maintaining a separate version like a GitHub with just a bunch of scripts that will allow you to run it independently again because. Otherwise, it means that they will almost immediately start to diverge. They will not provide exactly the same results. Having said that, most of the tools that we have here are relatively easy to run uh, uh, once you get them installed. Uh, Galaxy, if you install Galaxy, will ease you uh, that uh, installation part uh, because then you can install the tools directly from the tool shed. But yeah, so that I would say if you want to run them independently, that's totally fine. If not, you install Galaxy locally, and then you run them uh, from a command line as well. Cool. So now, please, again, if you have questions for Jolie or other speakers for today, let us know. So now I'm wondering, Jolie, since we have you here, so uh, do you have an idea how we can proceed with uh, result production exercise? So you, you mean from the practical? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know really. So the the idea was that there was a like a sort of a selected number of participants who could over the uh, you know next uh, few weeks or months uh, get some dedicated training, and uh, once we have a sort of short list of people who are interested, we can provide. A, uh, I mean, particularly they need an account in, in one of the Galaxy hubs, and then we can provide some additional resources uh, so that uh, the compute will be faster. And then we are happy to uh, guide you through step by step. Um, I suggest we also create a, like a Slack channel in the VGP yeah. Slack so that we can use that to coordinate the effort. Yeah, actually for the account, uh, we already, I would say most of them at least maybe even all of them already have accounts now. And the Slack, the Africa BB Slacks are already available, but just we need to, I think also thank God already create some uh, channel specifically for this one, for the Open Institute. Um, so maybe thank God he can 
fast to use a Slack channel link, then maybe you can post the material there. Then we can yes. start oh, from this. Yeah. Uh, I think we can also send uh, the slide and all that by email, as Lina was saying. The, um, I just need a list of emails or uh, user IDs that we're used to register yeah. on the website. Yes. And then okay. we can get started. Uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, so again, please, if you have any questions, like we still have time. So maybe we will stick around for five minutes more, if you don't mind. If not, if there is no any questions, then we can yeah, we I think can there's... really close the session. So we have and so Diego again. Please, if you have a question, unmute yourself and go ahead. I don't Diego. Cannot unmute himself. Need you to. Uh, ah, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, I did not Go open on. my my micro. Uh, I, I am Jaga. I am from Senegal. Yes. And uh, I think that uh, your idea is an excellent one to train people about uh, this important topic. And I think that this, tra this training can be can be do online. So it will be very important because it will be skill uh, some people about this topic. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, maybe I will take this. Actually, we, we, you know, it will be impossible to do it online because consider like really the assembly will take really very long time. So, okay. so this really is uh, eventually is a way we decide to do it like, you know, otherwise it is impossible to just sit you know, waiting for the assembly to be done. Okay. So well, one we, we comment here that the, the, the tutorials that were shared, they actually run pretty fast because again, they're based on yeast. But then of course, uh, you know, we want to see real um, uh, cases, no, real genomes, and that will take longer. So uh, that's why we can, you know, use a, um, like a Slack channel to coordinate that. So before to go to some questions, so there is some question about, or they already missing yesterday's session. So please already, both days already was live streamed. So it will be, the record will be available in the uh, Africa BB YouTube channel. So don't worry about the record. Yeah. And for the dedicated training, so, I think also is really, you know, the training material already available in the Galaxy. So please, like, if you are not really part of the Open Institute, you can you can also try it by yourself. Yeah, so uh, Abdullah, so yes, I don't know if, if, you, if you guys have talked about how to do the reproduction of the result, because I think that is the key component of this training. So uh, if Gilo can provide yeah. some Okay. Okay. You yeah, want to talk about just, it? No, maybe you missed this because yeah. I just talked with Julie about this and he saying really we need to provide him with that. So I think this is something will not really happen right now. So now for now we have to provide him by the link of the slugs of this Open Institute channel and list of the list of the accounts were created. Okay. And yeah. then he, he, from this, you know, point, he will start to share maybe in the Slack channel, the okay. material and everything, and we can start work. On it. Okay, so what will happen is, uh, so two things, Julian needs a Slack channel to be opened, right, for this? Exactly. exactly. So I will do that just now. Yeah. And, and secondly, yeah, 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 secondly, uh, he needs an account to be created. So I can see that people have created an account. So I will share the... The, the account created with Julio, then he can exactly. then set exactly. it up. So Ab Abdullah, you would then manage all of that. Yeah, uh, yeah please on, just yeah, put, put me in a loop, yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect then. Yes, perfect. Uh, maybe we will involve a couple of people from Galaxy side as well, just in case if there is any issue. Yeah, so yeah, I, think, please, I, think please. I think that is that is up to you, Julio, to kind of help coordinate in that angle, yeah. Awesome. 
I think there was another question or another hand raised, but then no, I don't see that. Now. Yeah, I think Julian, Julian, he was raising his hand, but then he decided, Julian, do you have, but I don't see him even. I can see him again. Okay, uh, Abdullah, I can see that we've created a account already. Um, yeah, just just Jolio he need. We didn't buzz the link to Jolio, so maybe it's okay. the time to right, send yeah. him the link and, and right, also so, the yeah. list of participants. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So if there is no uh, oh, someone raise, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have Riyadh here. Please go ahead. Please, Riyad, unmute yourself and go ahead. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Hello, you, you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, you hear me? Uh, thank you very much for your facilitators and your for conference. This is the uh, idea uh, about, about the microbiome and how can we cooperate with each other in the future. And regarding what about uh, if we need to, um, to establish a project channel with our colleague in the Africa. This is because my name is uh, Riyadh from Egypt. So how what can we could in the future? The, the first question, can you repeat? Hello? Yes. Oh. The, I think How can we collaborate in, in the future with each with each other in the in the field of microbiome? Yeah, yeah, we discussed Hello? this. Yeah, yeah, we got your question, Riyadh. So maybe this is not really a question related to Julio. It's more about the Africa BB. We already discussed this before, uh, like yesterday. But uh, thank God, if you really want to comment again about the microbiome and the microbial genomics work. Yeah, so I think the idea is that we are only focusing on eukaryotic microbes or eukaryotic, anything eukaryotic, but we're not going into the prokaryotic world, uh, basically. So um, if you want to collaborate, uh, I'm going to send you uh, an, a contact, we have a contact us page. So please feel free to send an email to this. I'm gonna I'm posting it in the chat box. Um, so I just sent it in the chat box. So send an email with details of you know your institution, what you do, and how you would like to collaborate. If you want to partner, we also have um, a partnership training, so you can become an institutional partner, the project partner. So then Josiah would follow up with you on the documentation required to establish that formally. So. Does that answer your question, Ray? Yeah. So now, uh, Julian, please go ahead, Julian. I think it needs to be unmuted. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh. Clear. All right. Thanks so much. I, I think I enjoyed the presentations. They're quite good, and, uh, especially Inel and uh, and uh, Julio. Uh, please, what I just want to ask is uh, about uh, the context, you know, you said, uh, you know, I had said this, that when there is a, a haploid, you have one peak, but if they are deployed, it's a deployed, you have two peaks. Then I just want to ask, does it mean that the number of peaks has direct uh, uh, bearing with uh, the ploidy level, in which case, uh, if it's triploid, possibly we expect a, a third peak. Then what happens? Uh, because I seem to see that the two peaks are not uh, equal, uh, actually. And uh, it, uh, does that actually mean variation in the DNA coming from the two uh, parental lineages? How can one interpret that difference in the height of the peaks? Yeah, and so, oh, okay. okay, go ahead, please. After this, no. I'll now address one. Okay, I'll address the height one first. So for the diploid, yeah. um, you'll, if you remember the zebra and finch one, the haploid peak was a lot higher. 
that means there's a yeah. lot more heterozygous. So yeah, there's a lot more differences between the parental, uh, the two parental haplotypes. So if the haploid peak is lower, then you'll have uh, less differences between the two of them. And with regard to the first question about it matching ploidy, yes, it usually does light up. Yeah, Julio is pulling up an example of from the genome scope paper. I believe on the right is a triploid. Um, on the right one is like a triploid arabidopsis maybe. But um, you'll, the peaks should cor correlate with the ploidy. They will kind of taper off later on, but it does usually co correlate with ploidy of your organism, yeah. Yeah, for, for plants, actually, we are possibly we could have uh, self-crossing uh, uh, individuals. And for such, it means that uh, there would be uh, very minimum uh, variation between the different uh, parental sets. In that case, do we still expect this uh, variation in the peaks? Uh, you'll probably see a very low, um, low haploid peak. You might see like a little bump, but it's probably just going to look like the haploid one, but I presume you'd still analyze it as a diploid. Yeah. I think also more the ploid, the even the more the peaks, and not just the more the peaks, but the higher the peaks, because you have more chances, basically. Even if the if there was a God that is lower, com if you compare to just a deployed scenario, then you will start to have higher peaks, because there are more pot there is more potential to have um, uh, essentially small variants that will generate new uh, cameras at uh, lower frequency. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, and then, uh, uh, when you come to the uh, chromosome assembly, um, is there a chance that uh, a case where there is a chromosome elaboration, for instance, a, 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 a translocation or inversion, is there a chance that uh, that could be captured at that point? Yeah, uh, will we, sorry, what was the, the final question? Yeah, what, yeah, yeah, what I mean is um, once, when there's a chromosomal aberration, actually the chromosome, the DNA breaks into fragments, some could form and then get inserted again, some could move to other uh, locations. It is expected that in the sequencing process, directly it will be captured. But yeah. what I am saying, at that point of uh, chromosomal assembly, that uh, uh, building it, the, the whole sequences to form, reconstruct the chromosomes. Chromosome one, chromosome, yeah. chromosome. So it really, It really depends, no? I mean, in theory, yes, no? The, each individual haplotype will have its own sequence and even uh, structural variants, uh, the large structural variants will be reflected in these sequences. And of course, it depends if uh, our current algorithms are good enough to uh, sort of uh, disentangle these, uh, these cases. But oftentimes, yes, you see that. Yeah, thank you, Julian. Yeah. Actually, thank you, thank you. In, yeah, in our current... <laughs> I look forward to more meetings. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Julian. So I'm um, really also yes. now is coming to my mind talking to the blend. So I'm wondering, Julio, if you really try other genomes than vertebrates. We did, yes, that's a good question, actually. I mean, of course, we have the vertebrate genome lab and the vertebrate genomes project. So that's our main focus. Uh, but we do have some collaborations on insects. Uh, so we did uh, try some of these as well. Uh, in terms of like, uh, for instance, ploidy, we do have a few interesting uh, vertebrate cases. For instance, in some reptiles, there are three ploids, uh, or in fish, there are some tetraploids, like the sturgeon. But not, not really, you don't have any example with plants, for example. A example for what? of plants. Oh, plants, uh, we, we haven't, no, directly, we haven't, have, I've never done plants. The Sanger, uh, the, the, the Darwin Tree of Life, does a lot of plants. So, yeah. Cool. Okay. In fact, in fact my um, colleague, Olivier Fedrigo, the director of the facility, <laughs> always jokes and says, no, we're never going to do plants because extracting DNA <laughs> is painful. <laughs> yeah, like, 
you know, we always have this problem, like people, they talk about not really the problematic with plant, not really the sequencing, but even before the sequencing, to get right. the DNA itself. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, for many plants, actually, it's not necessarily more complicated than vertebrates. Some are diploids. Even if they are more than uh, diploids, it's uh, now the algorithms are pretty good and they, they work with plants as well. But yes, getting good quality DNA can be really complicated. Okay, any questions? Okay, then uh, I hope really, like really you enjoy this workshop and please, please fill the form of the evaluation and we promise you, we will provide all the link, all the tutorials and if the speakers also accept, we also will share the uh, their presentations. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Free to yeah. reach out if you have questions. Yeah, yeah. and for so, sure, yeah, feel free to send the question to either to Africa BB or speakers. And thanks so much. So, yeah. uh, thank I God. Do, I, I just added uh, Gilo to the Slack channel. So, Gilo, if you send me a list of people you think we should add, please uh, feel free to send them or you can add them yourself, whichever one is better. Okay. Yeah, so should I, I think, uh, so you you told me because I, I it appears uh, Linnell also was part of the assembly. If you also want her to be, then we'll kind yes. of uh, also add we'll it here. Yeah. Uh, also, Nandolina, who haven't, you haven't met yet, but yes, we'll have a few more people yeah. to yeah. send you. I'd be happy to join. Yeah. Day or maybe early next week. Uh, there is a, a holiday on Monday, so maybe it will be Tuesday, but um, we'll come back to you with it. Cool. Okay, guys. Then on behalf of all of you, I'll shout all the speakers for the two days, yesterday and today. And thank you so much for joining us and hope to see you in the next workshop. Thank, thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay. Bye. Have a nice weekend, all. Bye.